Wild Freaky Disgusting Sex Life of Sarah Bartman Sarah Bartman was an African woman who was enslaved and taken to Europe where her body was put on display for paying audiences. Such mistreatment was allowed to take place because the white society of the time regarded African people, and African women in particular, as inferior. Sarah Bartman was a member of the Khoikhoi people, her original African name is not known and her birth name is unknown but is thought by some to have been Cura. Supposedly, the closest to her given name, Sarge, is the diminutive form of Sarah in Cape Dutch. The use of the diminutive form commonly indicated familiarity, endearment, or contempt. Her surname has also been spelled Boltman and Boltman. Sarah's Early Life She was an infant when her mother died and her father was later killed by Bushman Sin people while driving cattle. Both of Boltman's parents died while she was still young, and she was married to a Khoi man as a teenager. Sarah Boltman was one of the first black women known to be subjected to human intimate trafficking. She was derisively named the Hot and Top Venus by Europeans as her body would be publicly examined and exposed inhumanly throughout the duration of her young life. Moreover, her experience reinforced the already existing and extremely negative intimate fascination with African women's bodies by the people of Europe. Sarah Boltman was born in 1789 at the Gamtuz River, now known as the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Boltman and her family were members of the Ganakwa group of the Khoi. Boltman grew up on a colonial farm where she and her family most likely worked as servants. Her mother died when she was aged two, and her father, who was a cattle driver, died when she was still a young girl. By her teenage years, Boltman married a Khoi man who was a drummer. They had a child together who died shortly after birth. When Boltman was 16, her husband was murdered by Dutch colonists. Soon after, she was sold into slavery to a traitor named Peter William Caesar, who took her to Cape Town where she became a domestic slave to his brother. There is evidence that she had two children, though both died as babies. She had a relationship with a poor Dutch soldier, Hendrik von Jong, who lived in Hout Bay near Cape Town, but the relationship ended when his regiment left the Cape. Botman had unusually large buttocks, possibly caused by a condition called steatopigia. Curiosity turns to perversity. Sarah never did make it home alive and after being put on display as a half-clothed oddity in London, she was taken to France and sold to an animal handler. Here her exploitation and degradation intensified as she was led around and given instruction like an animal, while her female organs were studied as an object of macabre interest and sexual peculiarity. It is also believed that during this time she fell, or was forced, into prostitution and became a heavy drinker. Popular white European opinion of the time viewed Africans as an oversexed, primal, lesser race, representing the link between animals and humans and the lowest form of human development. According to reports, however, Sarah was multilingual and, due to the diverse cultures that she had come into contact with, could fluently speak her own native language in addition to French, Dutch, and English. French naturalist Georges Cuvier, who had an intense interest in Sarah, described her as intelligent with an excellent memory for faces. Ironically, he was also of the opinion that she had ape-like traits and compared her to an orangutan and a monkey. After Cuvier had dissected Sarah's body, he pickled her brain and genitalia and placed them in jars on display at the Musée de Elam in Paris. There they remained for over a century until 1974, as a proof of Culvia's theory of racial evolution. Her organs, genitalia, and buttocks were thought to be evidence of her sexual primitivism and intellectual equality with that of an orangutan. Sarah is the first documented Khorasan to arrive in Europe and, although much of her story has been lost, over the years, she has come to be seen as the epitome of colonial exploitation, racism, and commodification of black people. 
Several books have been published about her treatment and cultural significance, with author Natasha Gordon Chaipemba penning. She has become the landscape upon which multiple narratives of exploitation and suffering within black womanhood have been enacted. Yet amid all this the woman remains invisible. While some claim she was given the option of being set free and returning home, others believe that she was coerced into continuing her role as Hottentop Venus. It could be argued that by this stage Sarah had lost all self-respect and hope and had, in a sense, given up on life. Some reports claim she enjoyed the attention and company of French high society while others believe she was used as nothing more than a prostitute, an object of sexual interest. Here her exploitation and degradation intensified as she was led around and given instruction like an animal. While her female organs were studied as an object of macabre interest and sexual peculiarity. It is also believed that during this time she fell, or was forced, into prostitution and became a heavy drinker. She was enslaved because of her big buttocks. An English doctor noticed her when he visited the Cape about 1810. He and the brother of the man to whom she was enslaved decided they could use Borotman's body to make money. Surgeon Alexander Dunlop was the frontman and conspirator behind the plan to exhibit Boltman. According to a British legal report of 26 November 1810, an affidavit supplied to the Court of King's Bench from a Mr. Bullock of Liverpool Museum stated, some months since, a Mr. Alexander Dunlop, who he believed was a surgeon in the army, came to him to sell the skin of a camelopard which he had brought from the Cape of Good Hope. Some time after, Mr. Dunlop again called on Mr. Bullock, and told him that he had then on her way from the Cape a female Hottentot of very singular appearance, that she would make the fortune of any person who showed her in London, and that he, Dunlop, was under an engagement to send her back in two years. Lord Caledon, governor of the Cape, gave permission for the trip, but later said he regretted it after he fully learned the purpose of the trip. Botman was first exhibited in London in the Egyptian Hall at Piccadilly Circus on November 24, 1810. Her public treatment, however, quickly drew the attention of British abolitionists who charged Dunlop and the Caesars with holding Boltman against her will. The court ruled against Boltman after Peter Caesar produced the contract that had been signed by Boltman. Botman also testified that she was not being mistreated, though she could not read. She signed a contract written by the doctor that required her to travel to England and Ireland as an indentured servant. However, the terms of the contract were false, and Botman remained enslaved for life in England. The doctors set up exhibitions of Botman's body. Botman was made to appear with very little clothing on, and many members of the public paid to see her, but Botman received little money. Some English people who were sympathetic to Boltman's plight filed a lawsuit to stop the exhibitions, but they lost their case when shown the contract that Boltman had signed. Boltman also testified that she was not being mistreated. In 1814, Boltman was sold to S. Rowe, an exhibitor in Paris, France, where the public showings continued. Rowe allowed patrons to exploit Boltman's body, making a significant profit off her mistreatment. She also was examined by scientists and brought out as an exhibit at wealthy people's parties and private salons in Paris. Botman's promoters did not need to concern themselves with slavery charges by the time she got to Paris. Her existence was really quite miserable and extraordinarily poor. Sarah was literally treated like an animal, there is some evidence to suggest that at one point, a collar was placed around her neck. Specifically, she was exhibited with a collar on some occasion. At the end of her life, she was penniless, which was probably connected to the economic depression in France after Napoleon's defeat, resulting in a dearth of audiences that were able and willing to pay to see her. According to present-day accounts in the New York Times and The Independent, she was also working as a prostitute. But the biography by Craze and Scully only notes that as an uncertain possibility since she was exhibited besides other places at the brothel and Shea des Fontaines.
Botman died in Paris in 1815 at about the age of 26 of an undetermined inflammatory ailment, possibly smallpox, while other sources suggest she contracted syphilis or pneumonia. Cuvier conducted a dissection, but no autopsy to inquire into the reasons for Botman's death. The French anatomist Henri Marie de Crotte de Blainville published notes on the dissection in 1816, which were republished by Georges Cuvier in the Memoirs du Muséum d'Histoire Naturelle in 1817. Cuvier, who had met Boltman, notes in his monograph that its subject was an intelligent woman with an excellent memory, particularly for faces. In addition to her native tongue, she spoke fluent Dutch and passable English. He describes her shoulders and back as graceful, arms slender, hands and feet as charming and pretty. He adds she was adept at playing the Jew's harp, could dance according to the traditions of her country, and had a lively personality. Despite this, Cuvier interpreted her remains in accordance with his theories on racial evolution, as evidencing ape-like traits. He thought her small, all ears were similar to those of an orangutan and also compared her vivacity when alive to the quickness of a monkey. He was part of a movement of scientists who were aiming to codify a hierarchy of races with the white man at the top. She was the first Koi Koi taken from her homeland. P.T. Barnum's show, featuring little people, advertised a 16-year-old Koi girl named Flora as the missing link and acquired six more Koi children later. Botman's tale may be better known because she was the first Koi Koi taken from her homeland or because of the extensive exploitation and examination of her body by scientists such as Georges Cuvier and others and the public, as well as the mistreatment she received during and after her lifetime. She was brought to the West for her exaggerated female form, and the European public developed an obsession with her reproductive organs. Her body parts were on display at the Musée de Rellum for 150 years, sparking awareness and sympathy in the public eye. Although Borman was the first Koi Koi to land in Europe, much of her story has been lost, and she is defined by her exploitation in the West. Julian Joseph V. U. Sarah Boltman's published image to validate typologies in his essay, Dictionnaire des Sciences Medicals, Dictionary of Medical Sciences. He summarizes the true nature of the black female within the framework of accepted medical discourse. Six focused on identifying her sexual organs as more developed and distinct in comparison to white female organs. All of his theories regarding sexual primitivism are influenced and supported by the anatomical studies and illustrations of Sarah Boltman, which were created by Georges Cuvier. It has been suggested by anthropologists that this body type was once more widespread in humans based on carvings of female forms dating to the Paleolithic era, collectively known as Venus figurines, also referred to as Sopian Venuses. From 1814 to 1870, there were at least seven scientific descriptions of the bodies of black women done in comparative anatomy. Cuvier's dissection of Boltman helped shape European science. Boltman, along with several other African women who were dissected, were referred to as Hottentots, or sometimes Bush women. The savage woman was seen as very distinct from the civilized female of Europe. Thus, 19th century scientists were fascinated by the hot and top Venus. In the 1800s, people in London were able to pay two shillings apiece to gaze upon her body. Boltman was considered a freak of nature, and for extra pay, one could even poke her with a stick or finger. There has been much speculation and study about colonialist influence that relates to Boltman's name, social status, her illustrated and performed presentation as the hot and top Venus, though considered an extremely offensive term and the negotiation for her body's return to her home. These components and events in Boltman's life have been used by activists and theorists to determine the ways in which 19th century European colonists exercised control and authority over Khoi people, and simultaneously crafted racist and sexist ideologies about their culture. 
Botman's body became a symbolic depiction of all African women as fierce. In addition to this, recent scholars have begun to analyze the surrounding events leading up to Botman's return to her homeland, and conclude that it is an expression of recent contemporary post-colonial objectives. In Janet Chabot's book review of Deborah Cameron's book Feminism and Linguistic Theory, Shibamoto discusses Cameron's study on the patriarchal context within language, which consequently influences the way in which women continue to be contained by or subject to ideologies created by the patriarchy. Many scholars have presented information on how Bortman's life was heavily controlled and manipulated by colonialist and patriarchal language. Botman grew up on a farm, there is no historical documentation of her indigenous keys, and she was given the Dutch name Tskari, by Dutch colonists who occupied the land she lived on during her childhood, according to Clifton Craze and Pamela S.C. Her first name is the Cape Dutch form for Sarah, which marked her as a colonialist servant. Sar J, the diminutive, was also a sign of affection. Encoded in her first name were the tensions of affection and exploitation. Her surname literally means bearded man in Dutch, it also means uncivilized, UNC barbarous, savage Sari Boltman. The savage servant Dutch colonizers also bestowed the term hot and tot, which is derived from hot and tt, Dutch approximations of common sounds in the Khoi language. The Dutch used this word when referencing Kui people because of the clicking sounds and staccato pronunciations that characterize the Kui language. These components of the Kui language were considered strange and bestial to Dutch colonizers. The term was used until the late 20th century, at which point most people understood its effect as a derogatory term. Travelogues that circulated in Europe would describe Africa as being uncivilized and lacking regard for religious virtue. Travelogues and imagery depicting black women as sexually primitive, and Savage enforced the belief that it was in Africa's best interest to be colonized by European settlers. Cultural and religious conversion was considered to be an altruistic act with imperialist undertones. Colonizers believed that they were reforming and correcting Kaisen culture in the name of the Christian faith and empire. Scholarly arguments discuss how Boltman's body became a symbolic depiction of all African women as fierce, savage, naked, and untamable. It played a crucial role in colonizing parts of Africa and shaping narratives. During the lengthy negotiation to have Boltman's body returned to her home country after her death, the assistant curator of the Musea de Loma, Felipe Menia, argued against her return, stating, We never know what science will be able to tell us in the future. If she is buried, this chance will be lost for us. She remains a very important treasure, according to Sadak Cressy. Due to the continued treatment of Boltman's body as a cultural artifact, Felipe Mina's statement is contemporary evidence of the same type of ideology that surrounded Boltman's body, while she was alive in the 18th century. All eyes on the unusual woman in Piccadilly. Upon arrival in London, Sarah was put to work immediately. Her unusually large buttocks and the proportions of her figure quickly made her the subject of fascination in the streets of London. Piccadilly, a street that was full of various oddities such as people with different deformities, hosted Sarah's shows. In the Egyptian Hall at Piccadilly Circus on November 24, 1810, Bartman was first exhibited. On stage, she wore skin-tight, flesh-colored clothing. She was also embroidered with beads and feathers, and she smoked a pipe. For two shillings, people came to see the newest oddity in Piccadilly. For a few more shillings, you could poke her with a stick or cane. Wealthy customers paid more for private shows in their homes, and their guests were allowed to touch her. Promoters described Bartman's genitalia as resembling the skin that hangs from a turkey's throat. On November 26, 1810, the Times reported about how she looked, she is dressed in a color as nearly resembling her skin as possible. The dress is contrived to exhibit the entire frame of her body, and the spectators are even invited to examine the peculiarities of her form. 
a handwritten note made on an exhibition flyer by someone who saw Bartman in London in January 1811 indicates curiosity about her origins and probably reproduce some of the language from the exhibition. Sarji is 22 years old, is for feet 10 inches high, and has, for a Hottentot, a good capacity. She lived in the occupation of a cook at the Cape of Good Hope. Her country is situated not less than 600 miles from the Cape, the inhabitants of which are rich in cattle and sell them by barter for a mere trifle. A bottle of brandy or small roll of tobacco will purchase several sheep, their principal trade is in cattle skins or tallow. Beyond this nation is another, of small stature, very subtle and fierce, the Dutch could not bring them under subjection, and shot them whenever they found them. You have to remember that, at the time, it was highly fashionable and desirable for women to have large bottoms, so lots of people envied what she had naturally, without having to accentuate her figure. Charles Matthews, a comedian who lived in London at the time of Sarah's station there, recorded his observations of visitors who came to see her. One pinched her, one gentleman poked her with his cane, one lady employed her parasol to ascertain that all was, as she called it, natural, he wrote. Sarah's exhibitions were very popular among the high and low in London society. Her arrival in England coincided with speculations that Lord Grenville and his coalition of Whigs, known as the Broad Bottoms, because of Grenville's large behind, would try to seize the government. Sarah was a gift to cartoonists who drew caricatures comparing Grenville's behind to Sarah's. One cartoonist, William Heath, drew a caricature with another figure measuring their respective posterior sizes. He titled it a pair of broad bottoms. The Slave Abolitionist Movement and Barman As Sarah Bartman's shows grew in popularity in Piccadilly, the British campaign against slavery was becoming more popular around the world. In 1807, Britain abolished the slave trade, but not slavery itself. However, the treatment of Bartman by her promoters caught the attention of the abolitionist. An abolitionist society called the African Association conducted a newspaper campaign for her release. A prominent abolitionist, Zachary Macaulay, was at the forefront of the protest for her release. However, Hendrik Cesar, under the guise of caring for Bartman, countered that she was entitled to earn a living however she wanted. Zachary Macaulay and other abolitionists decided to take the matter to court. At the Court of King's Bench, evidence was presented. The African Association described the degrading conditions under which Bartman had been brought into Britain. It also described that she was exhibited for show in inhumane conditions that included coercion and animal-like treatment. During the judicial inquiry, a written contract emerged. The contract was purportedly signed by Bartman. Cesar and Dunlop used this document to satisfy the authorities that Bartman came to London under her own free will. When it was Bartman's turn to testify, she corroborated the contract. She was questioned for three hours, and she testified in their favor. As a result, Dunlop and Cesar weren't convicted. The circumstances surrounding the case have largely been called to question. Many historians have agreed that because Dunlop was in the courtroom, it was hard for Bartman to testify against her handlers. Bartman also stated in her account that she wasn't tortured, sexually abused, or under restraint, but this directly contradicted what many eyewitnesses saw during her shows. The written contract that was produced, which Bartman didn't have a copy of, has been considered legal subterfuge. However, the court adjusted the terms of the contract to ensure that Bartman was paid fairly and given better clothes. After the case, Sarah's show was less popular among the London audience. Her handlers began to take her on tour around Britain and Ireland. She was said to have been baptized in Manchester as Sarah Bartman. Some historical accounts say she got married at the same time. After spending four years in Britain, it was time to move. In September 1814, 
Bartman was moved from England to France. France was a country suffering from duality of mind about the abolition of slavery. It had first outlawed slavery in 1794, then reinstated it in 1802. Tired, it abolished it permanently in 1848. This duality of mind caused Bartman's condition to worsen in France. Henry Taylor, the man who brought Bartman to France, sold her off to an animal trainer named S. Rowe. She instantly gained celebrity status again. There, she was exhibited by Rowe at the Café de Paris, Palais Royal, and attended society parties. She was showcased alongside a baby rhinoceros, and was given orders to sit or stand like a dog. She was displayed almost completely naked. She wore just a little more than a tan loincloth. It was because of her insistence that she be allowed to cover that which was culturally sacred that she was allowed the loincloth. Craze and Scully state in their book, by the time she got to Paris, her existence was really quite miserable and extraordinarily poor. Sarah was literally treated like an animal. There is some evidence to suggest that at one point a collar was placed around her neck. During her exhibitions in France, she became entangled with scientific racism. French naturalist, Georges Cuvier, became attracted to Bartman's constant displays. Seeing how her body looked piqued Cuvier's interest. He asked Rowe if he could allow Bartman's body to be studied as a scientific specimen, to which Rowe agreed. Despite being a critic of theories of evolution, Cuvier was well known for his contributions to anatomy and early recognition of dinosaurs and other Mesozoic reptiles. Cuvier and others examined Sarah, with Frederick Cuvier, the younger brother of George's, though also a naturalist and paleontologist, commenting, she was obliging enough to undress and to allow herself to be painted in the nude. But this was untrue. Bartman was always wearing her loincloth, but there was a Western over-sexualized perception about people in other places in the world who practiced cultural or sacred nakedness. Cuvier and other French anatomists, zoologists, and physiologists studied Bartman's body. Her large buttocks and extended labia were used to compare blacks to orangutans. Her body was thought to be evidence of her sexual primitivism and intellectual equality with an orangutan. Sauer's death After Boltman's death, scientists preserved parts of her body for many years. Her remains were displayed in a museum in Paris to support racist theories surrounding those of African ancestry. In 1994, Nelson Mandela, the new president of South Africa, asked France to return Boltman's remains. In 2002, France agreed, and Boltman's remains were buried near her birthplace in the Eastern Cape province. St. Hilaire applied on behalf of the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle to retain her remains. Cuvier had preserved her brain, genitalia, and skeleton on the grounds that it was a singular specimen of humanity and therefore of special scientific interest. The application was approved, and Boltman's skeleton and body cast were displayed in the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle. Innocent from Rwanda has shown empathy with Nelson Mandela and requests to bring her body to South Africa. Her skull was stolen in 1827 but returned a few months later. The restored skeleton and skull continued to arouse the interest of visitors, until the remains were moved to the Musée de Elam when it was founded in 1937 and continued up until the late 1970s. Her body cast and skeleton stood side by side and faced away from the viewer, which emphasized her state of pida, an accumulation of fat on the buttock, while reinforcing that aspect as the primary interest of her body. The Botman exhibit proved popular until it elicited complaints for being a degrading representation of women. The skeleton was removed in 1974, and the body cast in 1976. From the 1940s, there were sporadic calls for the return of her remains. A poem written in 1978 by South African poet Diana Ferris, herself of coy descent, entitled, I've Come to Take You Home, 
played a pivotal role in spurring the movement to bring Boltman's remains back to her birth soil. The case gained worldwide prominence only after American paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould wrote The Mismeasure of Man in the 1980s. Manalupam, a researcher and jurist specializing in colonial South African history, also helped spur the movement to bring Botman's remains back to South Africa. After the victory of the African National Congress in the 1994 South African general election, President Nelson Mandela formally requested that France return the remains after much legal wrangling and debates in the French National Assembly. France acceded to the request on 6 March 2002, her remains were repatriated to her homeland, the Gamtuz Valley, on 6 May 2002, and they were buried on 9 August 2002 on Vergaderings Cop, a hill in the town of Hankey. Over 200 years after her birth, Sarah Boltman was not the only Koi Koi to be taken from her homeland. Her story is sometimes used to illustrate social and political strains, and through this, some facts have been lost. Dr. Yvette Abrahams, professor of women and gender studies at the University of the Western Cape, writes, We lack academic studies that view Sarah Boltman as anything other than a symbol. Her story becomes marginalized as it is always used to illustrate some other topic. Botman is used to represent African discrimination and suffering in the West, although there were many other Khoi people who were taken to Europe. Historian Neil Parsons writes of two Khoi children, 13 and 6 years old respectively, who were taken from South Africa and displayed at a holiday fair in Elberfeld, Prussia, in 1845. Cumans, a traveling show including two Khoi men, women, and a baby, toured Britain, Ireland, and France from 1846 to 1855. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe, and comment.